anything could be going on and I'm just focused. You know? um, so, but, but yeah, it's a discipline, you know, stepping back and thinking strategically about what, what you want to achieve and this and that. Um, I'm a bit of a nerd in that respect, you know, so um, I regularly, you know, review my goals and, and versus, yeah, what, what I thought were my goals at some stage and what actually happened. And my, you know, my philosophy is that, hey, control is an illusion, right? You got to let go in a way. But nonetheless, I, I do have goals and I plan. This episode of the Smart Athlete Podcast is brought to you by Solpri. If you're active at all, whether you're running or simply out walking for the day, you've probably experienced one of the number one problems that active people have, and that's chafing. Solpri's all new, all natural anti-chafe balm solves that problem while feeding your skin the vital nutrients it needs to be healthy. If you'd like to stop chafing once and for all and treat your body right, Go to Solpri.com to check out the anti-chafe bomb today. And that's S-O-L-P-R-I.com. Welcome to the Smart Athlete Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Funk. My guest today describes himself as a scientist entrepreneur. I'd also describe him as a serial entrepreneur. He's the author of the book, Dream Design Surf. He also is a triathlete and does yoga. Welcome to the show, Marcelo Bravo. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for joining me, Marcelo. I, I, uh, I, you know, as I'm reading through all the stuff that you do have done, um, I can't imagine that you're not a very busy person running multiple companies. As we were talking before we got going, you know, you've got family at home, everybody to take care of. <laughs> so I appreciate you make, taking time out of the day to, to spend time with me. Uh, it's a pleasure, actually. Uh, I'm really enjoying to have the conversation. Yeah, I, I am very busy, but in, in a very positive way. You know, I don't I don't feel overwhelmed. You know, um, in, in in a way, this working from home thing has um, made me very productive. You know? Yeah, the you know the thing that comes to mind for me when um, I think somebody about somebody like yourself, who I think we have kind of similar mindsets, though I think you operate on a larger scale than I do, is you know, time management. I think um, for the general person, we think about, you know, people running multiple companies, think about like the, the biggest examples like Gates and Musk and um, Bezos and, you know, running these large companies. And we all only have 24 hours, right? Trying to figure out, you know, how how is it possible that they can do all these things, yet some of us, you know, barely to figure out how to make lunch for ourselves. Uh, so I'm curious if you have any thoughts on time management, actually getting things done. Um, you know, how do you manage your day? Yeah, well, the first thing is about designing your life and designing what you do, right? So this book, Dream Design Surf, uh, the design component is uh, all about how do you design a, a venture in order for a scale, you know, that, you know, it is lower risk, it is a scalable, it, it's operationally um very efficient and, and if you step back and design your life in a way that allows you to be very effective then then you're very effective you know um on the other hand if you don't think through those things or don't design uh, the, the way you want to do things you end up with all kinds of inefficiencies built into your day you know so for me is you know yeah it's about leverage right so you only have so many hours so much energy to give to things how do you get most um, you know, where do you put your energy in, uh, that gives you most leverage and, and most output? You know? So that, 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 that I think is the key thing for me and our business, um, this supplements business, it, you know, um, it's, it's totally, you know, effective and it's, it's, it's external, you know, so I don't manufacture, I have my product manufacturer in Switzerland. Um, you know, we, we sell online, we sell through distributors, we, we leverage technology and, and it's, it's a very agile, small team behind the whole thing. And, um, and we focus on what, you know, what has impact uh, that, uh, and delivers the business instead of, you know, stuff that just kind of like makes you busy, you know, uh, 
and that applies to your day as well. You know, what do you, what do you do? You know, for me, it's, well, yeah, there's always a to do list, never ending, but you tackle the big ones right right up front. You know, um, so last night my son, because I involved my kids in whatever I do, you know, told me well this and that, you know, you know that I needed to change my website and um, from this website, and I just wrote immediately an email to someone, and then in the morning it was sorted. You know. Um, he was quite impressed, you know, because, you know, hey, we were able to just do it, you know, uh, and that that's the thing that we wanted done and, and it got done right away, you know. Um, we, you know, uh, one of the things I don't do is, like, we don't do meetings or, you know, you don't waste time, you know. I, I used to work for Procter & Gamble, right? Yeah. I worked for Procter & Gamble for many years and big company and I would say half of your time was just, you know, managing your existence within an organization, you know. And then another quarter of your time was just the politics of that. And then your effective time to get stuff done was this much. You know? <laughs> uh, whereas here, you know, hey, you, you, your effective time is this and the organization and the politics are, you know, very, very thin, you know, yeah. I think the, the part um, I have trouble with, which I've been doing better about, uh, as you know, since my assistant is the one that got in touch with you is delegating tasks away. You know, like I used to be the one looking for everything. podcast guests and sending emails and all this kind of thing. And uh, yeah, just delegating tasks and making sure that I'm not trying to do everything and being more effective. Um, and then I think about, you know, how, how do I apply that to my everyday life? You know, there's some things I guess you can do if I like I've got a yard so I could hire somebody to, you know, take care of the yard and do all of those things. And then you've got more time. Um, anyway, just I always wonder how you know different people deal with their own situation, and like you said, design what it is that they're after. You know that that certain kind of life that they want to live. Yeah, exactly. And also, you, you have to identify the stuff that slows you down, right? Uh, right. And and remove remove it. Yeah. So, like, if you're training. You know, you got to identify the blocks to your training and remove those things from your life, you know, in order to enable then, you know, your training. Yeah. So one has to be active in that respect, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So how do I now I, I do this a little bit, but uh, in your opinion, say I'm caught up, whether I, you know, maybe, maybe I, we go back. So, so when you're working at PNG and you're caught up, you're not running your own show, you know, you're working for a corporate environment, um, you've got kids at home. How do you step back from that and kind of divorce yourself from where you are to figure out where you want to go? Um, well, I, I think it's something you learn to do, right? Um, my wife says I'm a bit autistic, right? So I can have tons of stuff going on around me and, you know, room. I mean, my thing, you know, I'm very focused. You know, mm -hmm. Once I'm focused, I'm focused. Anything could be going on and I'm just focused, you know. Um, so, but, but yeah, it's a discipline, you know, stepping back and thinking strategically about what, what you want to achieve and this and that. Um, I'm a bit of a nerd in that respect, you know, so um, I regularly, you know, review my goals and, and versus yeah what what i thought were my goals at some stage and what actually happened and my, you know my philosophy is that hey control is an illusion right and you got to let go in a way but nonetheless i i do have goals and i plan um and i continually check that but at the same time you know this is the the, the surf and dream design surf you have to navigate all this because it's never going to be Pan out. It's never going to pan out the way you you thought or expected, right? Mm -hmm. So, but but this continual revision of, of you know checking the course um, is something I, I always do, and then I have some pivotal moments, you know, like when I turn sixty, you know, when I turn fifty, it's my ten year big plan, you know, big things I wanted to achieve in the next decade, you know? and I've just done the same thing recently when I turn sixty, right? The big things, um, um, and you know, so you know, I think I have one company in my in me yet right? mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm starting actually something but i said look it's the last one so it has to be something big and meaningful you know it cannot be just 
kind of like what I was doing 20 years ago or whatever. Um, um, so I'm actually um, spinning off a company here in Oxford um, soon, in the coming weeks, um, trying to, um, it's, it's, a, it's a cancer therapy. So I'm kind of like saying, if I'm going to spend my brain and energy and life energy um, uh, for the next few years, it's going to take a few years, you know, these things, I don't think it's going to be in the clinic before five years from now, five very intense years, then, you know, it has to be something big and meaningful, you know, so I'm, you know, I'm working in immune oncology. So, so that was kind of like, yeah, great. This is what I'm going to do this decade. It's going to be that, you know, and if it progresses, it's fantastic. It's part of my legacy. If it doesn't, you know, I try, you know, and I try it against something big, you know, and that makes it very relevant then either way, you know, um, so that's, yeah, so I do that regularly, but also at certain moments, you know, like then you take advantage of the fact that you, you hit a milestone in your life and you say, great, I'm going to think of the next 10 years, you know, or the next 10. Um, and I've been doing that a, a few times and now I kind of say, well, there's not too many of those left, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, I was going to do that half Ironman in Barcelona with a bunch of friends, right? It's great. You know, we're all quite senior and it's going to be great fun. So we're still going to do it, you know, as soon as things go back to normal, we're going to be doing that, you know? So that you kind of answered my, one of the things I was thinking about, because mm -hmm. um, I think I read and correct me if I'm wrong, um, that since you have moved to the UK and you've been there at least 18 years now, you started four companies yeah, in your time. Yeah, yeah, yeah 20, 20, 20 now. Okay. Been here for 20 years. Now. So, you know, I mean, most people don't start one company, let alone four or five, or maybe you're working on six now talking about the new one. Um, and it's just, I, it, it, the kind of um, joking question I have for you is you're not tired of it yet? No, not at all. Yeah. <laughs> It's what gives me life, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's like air, you know? It's what gives me life. Th this new one is quite interesting. Um, I mean, I came here 20 years ago because, you know, I had been working for Procter & Gamble for 15 years or, or so. And I had started, you know, I wanted to be an entrepreneur, you know, uh, and I had started a little business. But it was mad, right? I was traveling around the world with P&G, coming back home on weekends. You know, I literally put in a millionaire miles in my last seven years with, Procter and Gamble, and I would come home on weekends to work on my thing, right? Um, and then my wife said, "Look, it's either that or Procter and Gamble. If not both, you know, we need to have a life." And I said, "Well, but you know, I, I, I don't think I can go right now for that. Uh, I, you know, I was a scientist and I was in R and D. I want to go and do a, a, an MBA." So we came to London to, you know, I came to London Business School for a year to take a year off, think about things, figure out, you know. Um, uh, how I wanted to do things and, and whatnot. And came to London for a year, ended up working for a company called Boots, which is a pharmaceutical chain. There, there was Boots, Walgreens now. Um, and, but they had a pharmaceutical company within it. Uh, I went to work with them for a little while, now in corporate strategy, and I left to start a business. Um, and, um, and that was my first business, and that would have been 17, 18 years ago. Um, and that was great. Um, uh, one thing led to another. I ended up doing a spin off from Oxford. I moved to Oxford. Oxford is a great place that ticked all the boxes as a place to raise a family, a place where there's a lot of innovation, a lot of science, a lot of new technology, um, um, and also very well connected to the world. You know, it's right next to London and Heathrow and whatnot. So a great place for this type of activity and you know one thing has led to another and and, and now i'm, I'm and, and yeah so then i was running this company that i founded oxford pharma science which is consumer healthcare company and but you know it wasn't my background you know my background was in consumer goods with procter and gamble and whatnot and here i was running clinical trials and all that stuff so i said i you know although i was surrounded with you know experts you know so the, you know the clinical trials manager the regulatory manager whatnot I felt I needed to, 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 to train myself. And, and I was looking for um, online for a course to do. And there was this course titled um, Clinical Trials in Drug Development. Um, uh, it was in Oxford, you know. So I went to take it, you know, it was a, a one week thing 
with people from all over the world. I was the only lucky one that just cycled to, to, to the venue, right? And, um, and it was part of a master's program. So I took it for credit. I submitted then a piece of work. And then I kept taking the other courses and they were related to what I was doing. But one of the lecturers uh, that came to talk uh, about his you know, new, new, new science, really, you know, it was just so impressive, so interesting. Because uh, that's the other thing. I was working with food supplements. I was working with generic medicines. This was all about like the new stuff, you know, gene therapies, cell cell therapies, all you know, um, all the new things that, you know we, we hear about, and and this just fascinated me. So I met this um, group of researchers, and, and and started working with them. So I did my dissertation in their lab. So actually, 2019. Uh, I went back to a lab for the first time in decades. You know, I was every weekend working in a lab, learning to do these new things. And um, and then in March last year, just as we're getting going into lockdown here, I went fundraising. You know, so we did it all virtually through Zoom. Uh, and and now we're, we're we're spinning the company off. And and it's really what I describe as science fiction biology, right? It's stuff that you, you wouldn't believe in. And that for me is fascinating. So that, you know, yeah, for me is life. You know, it, it keeps me alive. It's exactly what I think um, I want to be doing till till I really run out of air. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I got to back you up a little bit. Um, so you're you're working at PNG and then you make the, well, no, you was, I'm trying to remember exactly where you were. You're making the jump from no clinical experience um, to uh, a point where you have uh, the ability to run, you know, a clinical setting, but then that class is really only what you, I think you said it was a week long, you know, and this, as a side note, this is where we booked you on such short notice. I wish I could have gotten a hold of your book to read before we talked, but, you know, how do you get the confidence to make that leap to say, yes, like I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna have no experience, but I'm gonna go do this anyway. Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, uh, madness? <laughs> no, confidence, of, of course. I mean, yeah, I, I ended up all of a sudden running clinical trials mm -hmm. and I didn't have a, you know, a drug development background really. Uh, but, you know, I surrounded myself with people that, that had this background, right? So my team was very, very qualified. But I always like, you know, um, I was always like, you know, arguing things that sometimes were mad for them or sometimes not. Actually, when I went through the course, after having run like at least three clinical trials, I, you know, I realized that I had learned a lot, you know, very fast by doing it, you know. So, so the course just kind of like rounded up my, my knowledge or gave support to, 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 to my understanding of the whole field. Um, so I realized actually, and I did very well on, on that master's, um, that I, I, I know quite a, quite a bit. And I, it was all, Procter & Gamble used to talk about uh, learn by doing, you know, it, it was learn by doing, you know, and we learn by doing and, and, you know, but you have to, now we have tools to complement and accelerate our learning. I mean, it's amazing. I'm quite an expert in this new thing I'm doing because uh, that's the field of my dissertation. And I possibly have read almost every publication that you want to read um, in, in the field. You know? So you, you can accelerate your learning. Now, I was fortunate also to, I, I got some training in the lab. So I, I develop lab skills in this, this are cell therapies, right? But I'm never going to be as good as the other people in the lab. But I, now I know what they're doing and I know what the the roadblocks are and all the problems um, that, that we need to solve. So, um, you know, you're never going to be a craftsman. Um, well, you, you could if that's what you want to do, but that's not where I want to apply myself now. You know, this is, I'm a chemical engineer by training actually, and a chemist. And this is really a, a, an engineering project now. It's about how to take this thing that's, you know, it's, it, it's made in the lab. Um, I, I got, got to industrialize it, you know, I, I need to come up with a manufacturing protocol to make these cells in, in a, what's called a GMP environment, um, so that the product, you know, which is it's a product, but it's a cellular product, it's a bunch of cells in a jar, 
are always the same and they do what they're supposed to do. So it's, it's exactly what you're doing when you're making, working for Procter & Gamble, making boxes of soap, you know, mm -hmm. it's about making a product with quality, re, you know, repeatedly, reliably. So that's, uh, in, in a sense, yeah, it, it's connecting the dots with everything you, you, you have experience with, you know, um, so, so yeah, but confidence, I think, comes from, you know, you know, um, having had, I, I think, a few times in, your, in, in one's life, the, the exposure to situations in, in where everything is new, and then learning how to manage that and how to deal with that. You know, I think and that I think comes with experience, right? So, you've been thrown at so many new things, you know, um, that no matter what you throw at me, I'll tackle it. You know. Part of it is about knowing, well, great. It's about teams, it's about getting the right group of people um, around you and, you know, uh, connected. You know, so it's having, I think my, my experience now is really about, great, what is what is the problem here? What are the resources I wanted to harness and then making that happen, you know? Yeah. Thinking about confidence, you know, one of the things that I think about um, because I, you know, I, I run a couple of companies, but I there I think business people in general would deem them lifestyle companies because it's just it's me. I've got, you know, my assistant who contacted you. I've got my video editor, but really that's just it. You know, it's a very small team. Um, you know, I, I think I think sometimes I wonder, you know, when we think about designing our life, trying to figure out what we want to do, whether it's a matter of. I simply prefer this way, or if I'm risk averse and don't have the confidence to go big. So I'm curious about your thoughts on, you know, raising capital, taking companies public, that whole thing, because it's it's a world that's completely foreign to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, confidence, risk, uh, scalability—all these things kind of like play together. Um, but before we go there, I, I think I should say something. So when I signed up to my first triathlon, I didn't really swim. Mm -hmm. You know, so I said, well, I'm gonna have to learn to swim. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so but and that was a challenge, you know. So I, I guess I had the confidence to say, Well, great, you know, there's a swim thing I have to deal with. I'll, I'll just go and deal with it, you know. So that's when I started really, you know, and I had for many, many years I had been a windsurfer. You know, and you know, very active, you know, water sports. But I, you know, I wasn't a swimmer. I never learned to swim really. You know, um, uh, I used to like spend eight hours on top of a windsurf and never, never fall. You know, because you know, I couldn't fall. You know, I, you know, I couldn't swim. You know, uh, so anyway, so just trying to say, look, you know, confidence is something that you have to sort in your head. You know, mm -hmm. and then clearly, great, I got to learn to swim. So what do I need to do to get from A to B? You know, and. And as an engineer, you say, well, these are the steps and you go through them, you know, and still swimming is my, 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 well, it's not my weak discipline anymore. It's kind of like, not my strongest, but I'm in the middle of the pack and I, it, it's enjoyable, you know? Mm -hmm. um, um, so, but anyway, so businesses, okay. Businesses, this, I write about this in my book, you know, some people think that success means a huge building with a huge parking lot with a bunch of cars outside and all these employees that for me is very risky you know that's you know that that says a lot of fixed cost you know mm -hmm. um and you know and, and a lot of inventory and whatnot and when you design things properly you can have a very a global business with none of that you know mm -hmm. um you know so you know it's, it's more about you know just like when you're doing you know uh, facebook marketing right you know when to scale a campaign or not and you actually, you're, you know, you're quite risk averse, right? You want to see it work before you scale it, right? Right. But when it works, then you scale it, right? And it's the same thing, right? So when you know some of the formula works, then you scale it. And if you design it properly, you can scale it with, without having, you know, because, yeah, I, I do have an aversion to, like, big, complicated organizations. You know, I don't want to create another Procter & Gamble, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but now you can scale, you, you know, there's all kinds of, global products and services that, that have very light teams behind them you know 
um, in biotechnology, for example, you, you can get an asset. You know, people talk about the asset, the asset being the, the molecule or, or, or the therapy, you know, all the way to the clinic and, and through to partnership with, with large pharma, which is typically the exit, with very small teams, sometimes, you know, one or two people and, and everything is, a lot of things are contracted out um, and run through external contractors. In, in you know, my company, for example, we, we, we are, you know, um, orchestra directors, right, of external resources, you know. Mm -hmm. Our asset is really the intellectual property and, and other intellectual type assets, you know, so um, you know, um, dossiers, you know, in the industries, all the stuff you need to put together to go and file with a regulator somewhere uh, for a marketing approval. You know? So if you want to sell a medicine in the US, you need approval from the FDA, right? right. And to get approval from the FDA, you got to show up there with a stack this large of all kinds of evidence and this and, and data. And, and that is intellectual, it sits on a server, right? And, and what we do is generate all that, um, but mostly using external resource, you know, so I don't have, you know, a, a company that runs clinical trials. Now you can go and contract one. And, Generally, this whole industry has disaggregated in the past 20 years. So 20 years ago, Pfizer would have had everything in-house. Then as they restructure, they shut off bits of them that were doing these things. And those things have become, you know, contractors to the industry. So I use the same resources that Pfizer will be using um, because they're available, you know, all over the world, you know. So a very small team can take, you know, um, a pharmaceutical asset from the lab all the way to 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 market approval uh, without having to build all these um you know risky tangible assets you know um, and so on so anyway so i guess what i'm trying to say we're very scalable and that changes the equation because what i don't want to do is end up with a company that where i'm not doing what i do which what i love to do and what i'm doing is like doing performance appraisals for 100 people you know um, you know what I mean? So, so I think you need to, you need to read my book. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like, <laughs> then we can that's what I was like, I, I saw it and I was like, <laughs> you know, cause we, as I said, we, yeah. we booked you very quickly and, and, and anytime we have authors, yeah. I actually do read the book before we have you, have you on. It just, yeah. just happened to work out this time where it did not, but I was like, well, add that to the, add that to the list. Um, I kind of keep a list of things I, I need to be reading. Um, Sometimes you get around, it depends on where I am in my work schedule, where I actually get around to sitting down with that, that yeah. book list. But usually yeah. there comes a but time. You, you, yeah, I, I, I got to believe you can stay as agile and nimble as you are and scale significantly. Yeah. And then raising capital, well, raising capital changes things because the moment right. you have investors, you know, there's new people in the mix, you know, there's right. stakeholders, you know, and no matter, no matter how detached they are, they're not they always come with strings and yeah and and they're never gonna they're totally detached right so the moment you have shareholders then you have to have a board and then you have to have representatives of those shareholders either mm -hmm. direct representatives or, or or independent representatives and and then your job is, is slightly different you, you just start managing that interface you know so i took two companies public right um and um the last one, you know, your job changed. And I learned to, to do this new job, which was managing the city, the cities in, in London. It's the place where you, it's like Wall Street, it's the place where you, you know, so you talk about managing the city. So, I you know, I spent most of my time meeting fund managers or, or people that were watching investment and, and then managing my board, you know. Um, um, and I had little time to execution of the clinical programs, but, you know, I had the right people doing that bit. But, but my job basically changed, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, and I kind of like, and I was doing, I was running listed public companies for seven years. And the moment, uh, the, then this one company, we took it private again. And, and, and the moment that happened, and, you know, I had become very used to doing this day in, day out. And the moment that happened, I realized how much time I was spending managing the fact that the company was public. And, and all of a sudden I had this huge weight of my shoulders, right? Because it's quite heavy on your shoulders, right? Mm -hmm. Running a, a public company and, and uh, all that, all that, all that entails, you know, 
communications and investor relations and board governance and whatnot. Yeah, um, um, yeah. I, I was walking very lightly. I remember in London the day we, we went private because I so had been it, nonstop for seven years running the public company. Is that I'm trying to wrap it all together and figure out where this came in? Um, is that moment is that the the genesis of the book because you're you I mean you have this moment where where it all Whoa. steps back and do you think about okay that i mean that's is that the starting point or or how does that come about no the book came about because okay after all kinds of adventures you know good you know good experiences bad experiences i had a company that went into administration uh, but you know then i had you know uh, apparent success um, you know, people were coming up to me, right, to, to bounce off ideas, to ask for advice, you know, they're trying to raise capital, how do I go about it, you know, some advice, you know, maybe they had this idea, you know, what do you think about it? So I found myself regularly, uh, I find myself now as well, talking to people that, you know, and, and you never have enough time for everybody, right? And I found that I was, yeah, uh, I'm always kind of like giving the same advice. And there's madness, you know, there's method in the madness, you know, mm -hmm. um, I've learned stuff, you know, so, so I realized that, yeah, I, I had come up with the formula and, and, and this is what I was passing through. So I decided, look, hey, I'll put it down uh, on paper, I'll write a book. And then, so then I would tell people, look, go read the book. Then if you still have questions, come and talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, you know, I just, yeah, it was one of these crazy things, you know, I, you know, I just said, I'm going to write this book and I wrote it. Um, and it became a method. It's a method, really. It's a method to 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 develop new ventures with low risk, um, you know, um, uh, fast, you know, for fast growth, lower risk, and global impact. You know, and um, it's it's like a five step thing. And it's particularly it, not 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 specific only to, but you know, particularly suitable for companies that are based on on intellectual property of some sort. Or well, my argument is that. The more you can intellectualize the assets, you know, make them non-physical, make them stuff that's very portable, they can sit in a server, the lighter, lower risk is going to be, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so, so, so I created this method and then Oxford University that was always having people coming around and this and that kept inviting me to give like um, lectures and or, or, or speaking in front of people. Um, and so that book became a, a workshop, you know, so it became like an afternoon workshop. Um, um, and then occasionally companies call me and I do now a, a, um, a think and work like an entrepreneur, you know, innovate thinking and working like entrepreneur workshops for big companies. Mm -hmm. So, so then a few of those uh, in Asia, actually. Um, so, so yeah, I became part of what I do, uh, which is kind of funny, it breaks the routine once in a while. Uh, yeah. In fact, I was, I just did one in Malaysia last week from home by a zoom <laughs> you know uh, right so, yeah 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 so so that's where that book came from so it, it, it was a way of um codifying my experience i guess um yeah it was it was great i mean I, um actually i just put something on linkedin where someone wrote me sent me an email through linkedin saying hey we met on an airplane 10 years ago and you really empowered me in that conversation after that i went out and you know she was in a low point moment in her life or she had just closed the business that wasn't doing well or whatever and she went out to to start a very successful business and she said hey um i've been meaning to write to you all this time but anyway here you go and thank you so much for empowering me and it was great you know yeah so it's like wow that that's all i wanted you know because i know that book you know i, I think i think I, um I think I've sold like you know a couple thousand copies or something like that, not too many. But to entrepreneurs that have come to Oxford to do these workshops or these courses, they do they spend a week here. Yeah. And I know that a few of them have gone to start a business. And for me that yeah, great. It's it's like Johnny Appleseed, you know. So I hope that I have given those people better chances of success in whatever they they, they set out to do. And in that way it's very rewarding. You know? Yeah. 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 I, it it's always, regardless of the, the venue, whether it's, you know, in my case, making like very small consumer products or, you know, in your case with the book, it's always very rewarding 
when somebody's like in either a large in your case or small in my case scale when somebody says you know you made a positive impact on my life like that's it's very rewarding yeah. just in its yeah, own that's, sense that's to, to hear hey man like I, I i did i did something i you know i helped somebody um yeah. I, I think that's what draws me in particular um to entrepreneurship among other things but just like yeah. You get to see firsthand like that that impact that you have on people. Yeah, for me that's the most important thing, you know. That's really what it's all about, you know. You know, that's mm-hmm. that's that's what it is. Yeah. So thinking about that, I think uh, your your company, the Ultra Pharma, are working on the like inset alternatives. Can you tell me about what you guys are working on and um, as yeah, I understand so, it, so you're that, trying to replace op- opioids or uh, assist in yeah, reducing no, the so, uses so of that, that, Yeah, what we did there, it, it, it's a drug delivery platform. So it's, it's a way of delivering medicines. Right? Okay. It can be applied to new medicines, can be applied to old medicines. We, we particularly focused on the NSAIDs. The NSAIDs are the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. So IV aspirin, you know, ibuprofen, uh, naproxen, diclofenac. So these are the painkillers, you know, right? Um, the, the, old, the, the oldest, best known drug in the world is aspirin, right? Um, it was, um, I guess, invented, patented by, by the Germans um, way back in the 1890s. It's been of patent uh, forever. Um, but it's very, very, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's a derivative of a natural component, you know, so from the willow tree, right? So the Egyptians were using the willow tree to, that's an anti-inflammatory or uh, anti, you know, anti-fever, antipyretic and whatnot. Um, and, and then it was discovered that this thing in there called um, salicylic acid. And, and so then people were using in the 1700s salicylic acid. Salicylic acid is extremely harsh, puts a hole in your stomach, you know, right away. Mm-hmm. And then the Germans figure out to hang a little thing from the salicylic acid, an acetyl chain, you know, so acetyl salicylic acid is aspirin. It's milder, uh, but nonetheless, it's quite harsh in your stomach, you know, so you take aspirin, you may end up with a gastric bleed if you take it every day. Um, um, and then in the 1960s here in the UK, Boots, the company I work for, a chemist there was trying to invent a safer form of aspirin, basically, or an alternative to and he discovered ibuprofen. And then in the US, you know, someone wanted to do an alternative ibuprofen, they discovered naproxen and whatnot. So those are the, the, the second generation NSAIDs, ibuprofen, naproxen, diclofenac. Uh, they became widely uh, used as the prescription drugs, and then they were switched to over the counter. Now you buy them over the counter, right? You don't need a prescription for low doses. Um, uh, but they still, they're still quite harsh in the GI tract. You know? So if you actually go to a drugstore in the US and buy a, you know, Advil and you read the label, there's gonna be a black box. It's a black box statement, which says, hey, you know, be very careful basically if you're over 60, you know, and this can give you an ulcer. You know? um, and sadly, uh, people never read the back of the pack, right? And a few people end up in hospital with gastric bleeds. So anyway, this, this platform, this, this way of formulating the, the drug and delivering the drug uh, reduces that risk, you know, so makes, makes it much um, milder in the GI tract, you know. Uh, so that's, that's what that um, technology is doing. Um, we developed it, we took it to the clinic. Um, we, we persuaded the regulator here, the MHRA, that, um, that yeah, that, that our clinical trials showed this effect um, uh, endoscopy trials, uh, but the, the real opportunity commercially, because it takes so much money, you know, you got to run like it's called a phase three trial. You've heard of the phase three trials for vaccines, you know, there's right. large trials yes. to show efficacy and safety on a large population. Um, well, we said the only way to justify getting, doing all that work is in a big market. So it has to be the U S so we actually went to the FDA. And sadly, the FDA didn't agree with our trial protocol and um, came back with something that was just too risky and too expensive. So, so we didn't go ahead with that program. You know, so we stopped that program. I'm still trying to, 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 to take it you know, over the line, but it's going to have to be different. I have to think of 
a smaller, more niche drug, higher price, you know, where I can justify a different type of trial um, mm -hmm. um, and, and so on. But yeah, the application to those everyday pain medicines, I, I don't think it's going to go to market, at least not with us, um, because we just can't justify the investment in, in the phase three trial. Uh, but that's that's the type of thing you do, right? So you're always looking at unmet needs, unmet clinical needs, and then trying to find solutions, you know, um, which is the essence of the, the, the entrepreneurial process, right? It's really about, is there an unmet need in this case, an unmet patient need? Um, is there a solution in this case, this technology, you know, to to, to make the, the impact in the, in the uh, track is smaller. And then you try to to develop that and deliver it to the market. Um, but in the case of pharmaceuticals, it's quite complex because there's regulation, which needs to be there. I mean, uh, it, it's a market that needs to be regulated, but but it's hard to navigate and it's very risky and um, it's fascinating. But uh, sometimes it, yeah, a lot of, well, I have all this white hair because of my experience with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That that kind of leads me naturally into. So, there's a question I ask uh, everybody for the entire for an entire year um, that kind of transcends everybody's job or sport discipline. So this year's this question I'm asking this year, I think you're maybe particularly um, knowledgeable about answering and. The question is, how do you stay motivated after you fail to reach a goal? Um, well, I, I talked a little about that. So success and failure are um, labels that you assign to events, you know, and events just are events, right? It's you who decides, oh, that was a failure, that was a success. And if you think about goals, you know, the one thing I do is that I set my goals super high. And if you set them in a way that you can achieve them, they're not high enough, you know? So, so for, you know, so if you define failure as not meeting your goal, I'm asking you to fail. I want you to fail because what I really want you to do is to set goals that are really stretching. And I don't care, you know, if you don't get there, but you get here, that's success. You know, it may be <laughs> failure to you, but to people looking from the outside, that's success. So that's the first thing I forget the label. You know, uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've, I'm, I'm just a total failure. Everything I've, everything I've, you know, people look at what I've done and they, oh, very successful. But uh, it's evolving failures versus whatever I had in mind. Believe me, you know. So, you know, so, it, you know, who cares? You know? Yeah, uh, I'm always going for for something, you know, and. Winston Churchill, right, said um, success is going from failure to failure without ever losing your optimism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's it, you know. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm a total failure. You know, <laughs> I fail every day. You know. No, that's good. That's good, um, Marcelo. If people want to pick up the book, if they want to see what you're up to, where where can people find you and and kind of keep in touch with what, what's going on with you. Yeah, so, 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 so yeah, so I, the book website is called, it's called Dream, Design, Surf, you know, because it's three sections, Dream, Design, Surf. So just www.dreamdesignsurf.com and you can contact me through there. Um, my, my, my current company website is um, Oxford Pharma Science. You can also reach me through there, you can see what doing. Um, our supplement range is called Elactiva. That's really cool to look at. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's E-L-L-A-C, Elactiva, A-C-T-I-B-A. So E-L-L-A-C-T-I-B-A -E dot co dot UK. That's a dot co. Um, but uh, yeah, if you go to Dream Design Surf, you, you'll find me and you can reach, reach me there. Or LinkedIn, you'll find me on LinkedIn. Um, Marcelo Bravo with one L. It's important to mention that because there's there is a Marcello Bravo with uh, twelve, and it's this German guy that uh, thought Marcello Bravo was a great um, artistic name, but he's a male stripper. So don't look him up. Look for one with one <laughs> Marcello Bravo. Have you guys so if you've ended up in a uh, adult themed environment? Yeah, you're right, in I need to mention that because they may get the wrong they, they may get the wrong guy. You know. They, 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 <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, they make it the wrong guy. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Marcelo, yeah. thanks for thanks for hanging out with me today. But anyway, good. No, thank you. It's been great. So great. I, I'd like to hear what you, what you do and what you're up to. So let's stay in touch. Absolutely.